Well, good evening. I'm back after a couple of weeks, and yes, it's all been dominated, of course, by the mess the Conservative government have got themselves into. An attempted tax cut, well, that would never do. The globalists didn't want that. And a huge, humiliating U-turn has resulted. But amongst the other problems, mounting up for this government, 35,000 people have now crossed the English Channel, and they're coming at an increasing rate. And yet, here's the funny thing. With this show, I've led the national debate on this. I've woken people up as to what's going on in the English Channel and what the knock-on effects are in this country. When we're talking about it, everybody else is talking about it. And yet, having taken my foot off the brake for the last couple of weeks, I wondered, what would the coverage of the cross-channel crisis be? So I had a look this morning at the Daily Star, nothing. The Daily Mail, nothing. The Financial Times, nothing. The Mirror, the Telegraph, the I newspaper, the Express, the Times, the Guardian. Well, not much chance there. And only in the sun does Trevor Kavanagh give the cross-channel crisis a brief mention. 1,000 people crossed the English Channel yesterday. Haven't got the breakdown, but I'll bet you as sure as eggs is eggs, it'll be over 90% young men. I'll also bet you over half of them are coming from Albania. In fact, they were coming right through the day and night yesterday. As I say, confirmed over 1,000 yesterday, and you can see some of the footage of Dover Docks here. Um, and they're coming again today. Today, not quite as big. The wind got up this afternoon. Perhaps today's 300, something like that. I will promise you that on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week, the numbers will be huge because we're in for some very, very calm, unsettled weather. And the boasting on TikTok that we've been talking about on this show, that continues. Have a look at this posted by the Albanian gangs just over the course of the last 24 hours. And what you see... Here's a group going across the sand dunes and they finish up being apprehended by the French police. That was on the 8th of October, but no matter. The same gang and the same people are back on the 9th of October and this is what happens. Have a look. And all of that in broad daylight. In broad daylight, there's the dinghy going down the beach and 50 young men about to get in it and head off to the United Kingdom. I heard whilst I was away that the new Home Secretary, who I do rather like, because Suella Braverman at least has had the courage to suggest that we should leave the European Convention on Human Rights and its court in Strasbourg. And actually, unlike previous Home Secretaries, I think she means it, although Liz Truss, it would appear, wants more legal immigration into Britain and hasn't as yet said really very little, much at all, about illegal immigration, but she's giving the French another £50 million, pounds, another £50 million pounds to stop the boats leaving the beaches. What is the point of any of it if, as we just saw on that TikTok video, the boat is stopped on the 8th, but the same people come back in another boat and cross on the 9th? It is all a complete and utter waste of time. £5 million pounds a day is what the British taxpayer is now paying to put these people up in hotels but it's now reached a completely new level because they've run out of what we might call cheap hotels in which to send people they're now looking at exclusive hotels in some of the most beautiful parts of england my big question tonight's debate is when is enough enough farage at gbnews.uk so i learned over the weekend that camelot castle on the north cornish coast small village, Tintagel, and of course, the place that is famed for being the home of King Arthur. Camelot Castle, a magnificent building on the North Cornish coast, received a phone call from a government, a company working with the government, saying they wanted to book the hotel out. We spoke yesterday to John Mappin, the owner of Camelot Castle. Uh, initially, I thought it was a joke. 
because uh, I heard from my receptionist that there was this company that they wanted to rent the entire hotel uh, for 12 months, every single room booked. And it's not very often you get a phone call like that. So I actually called the company myself. And yes, in fact, that is what it was. And it was a company uh, trying to source hotels for, for the asylum seekers or the refugees that are coming in, um, you know, on the boats or by various different means. Tintagel is is the historic uh, birthplace of King Arthur. Uh, this is where, mythologically speaking, uh, he was supposed to have been born. Uh, Camelot Castle itself sits on a cliff. It has a 270 degree ocean view. It looks out over the, as I say, mythological birthplace of King Arthur. Actually, Camelot Castle was one of the primary tourist destinations in Victorian England. This is where people took their holidays. And it was Brighton uh, here and Manchester. Uh, it was a hospital during the war. Um, it was also a girls' school during the war. My primary concern is the damage that this does, as I say, to the local community. Also, I had another concern that, that you know, if these were uh, people coming in from, from overseas that, let's say, weren't used to our culture, what would, you know, would they, you know, trash the place or would they damage the, the hotel? And I said, what would this government solution for that be? And they rather surprisingly said, well, don't worry, uh, just take photographs of, of the rooms and uh, if there's any damage at all, it'll all be, you know, repaired at the government. Uh, government's expense, well, of course, that's the taxpayer's expense. The other thing that was shocking to me, absolutely shocking, is I said, well, what would you need the same staffing? You'll say, oh, no, 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 don't worry. Uh, you can fire all your staff and um, all but three. And if you don't want to keep those on, we just need the hotel cleaned once a week. And you literally couldn't make it up. And it would be funny if it wasn't for the fact that you know uh a lot of elderly people around here are seriously worried about their bills they are terrified as to what's going to happen this winter and surely that is where money should be being spent is to give such people relief and i find this story completely illustrative of the fact that this government does not think with outcome. It just is solving the problem of the moment. And it's almost like they, they, they pick up Twitter in the morning, look at what um, is getting the most attention and come up with a wacky policy uh, to solve the problem of the tweet of the day. Um, and, 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 and that is no way to govern. I, I personally, I'm of the view that the boat should be turned around and, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the Navy should be defending our island. Well, that was John Mappet, the owner of Camelot Castle. And we thought this story really mattered. A beautiful, historic hotel in one of the most amazing parts of the United Kingdom. And clearly, if that hotel was taken for a year or more and filled wall to wall with young men that had recently crossed the English Channel, the effects, the financial effects and, 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 and perhaps social effects on Tintagel would, I think, have been disastrous. We thought this mattered, so we sent Jeff Moody, our Southwest reporter, down to Cornwall, and he's there in Camelot Castle this evening. Jeff, hello. Hello, well, I am indeed. I'm in the ballroom here. It's beautiful. It's incredibly opulent, as you'd expect. Um, you can't really see the views out of the window because it's going dark, but we're surrounded by sea on three sides. It really is the most stunning location. Um, opulent, yes. Comfortable, yes. Luxury, yes. But there's also a a family feel here, a homely feel. The fires are lit. Um, the staff are very friendly. It's a very nice place to be. Um, I've been talking to people this afternoon about how they're reacting to this news, how they're reacting to this proposal. Um, I've been talking to people that are uh, coming down to the hotel just for a night or two. I've been talking to people that work here too. The kind of views we're getting, I would say, are threefold. Firstly, people are saying, well, 
it's not fair, is it? People are paying guests, you know, I was talking to one guest and, you know, he pays a, a good amount of money to come and stay here for the night. And the thought that, well, someone's going to stay here for a year for free is not something that sits very easily, particularly at the moment with the cost of living crisis. There's also the issue of employment. This hotel employs many people from the village. And of course, not just the employment, but the people that stay here. And Tintagel is a very small community. The people that stay here, uh, shop around here. They use the local restaurants, the local bars. And so they really pay into that industry, into, into that um, economy. And finally, the idea of the, 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 the cultural issue here, the fact that suddenly Tintagel won't be for the Cornish. It will be surrounded by people that don't have that connection with the place. They haven't, they're not here because they wanted to be here. They're here because that's where they've been told to go. Let's have a look at what some of them said to me earlier on. In this area, it's very much um, hospitality, tourism, and I think it take away um, all of that because Tintagel is a small village and this is one of the largest hotels around here. Morally, it's a difficult problem with asylum seekers, isn't it? You know, because some are no doubt escaping persecution and some may be working the system. I don't understand why they want to use such a beautiful hotel, close it down, which would effectively close down the village for at least a year. Um, well, it's not something that I think that should be done, personally, um, because um, you don't know the sort of people that you would be taking on. And uh, otherwise, I mean, people are going to be losing their jobs for, who knows, a year or maybe more, or, you know, so I think it's not a good thing, personally. Well, that's some of the views of uh, people who work here and are staying here. Let's speak to John. That uh, Nigel, you spoke to him earlier on on Zoom, but let's speak to him in person. Hello to you, John. Hello. What a beautiful place this is. Oh, hi. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, Gorgeous, isn't it? Well, very warm welcome to you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, give me some sense of what the reaction has been since this story broke at the weekend. Well, uh, we've actually had a lot of phone calls and uh, tremendous appreciation from the local community, but also from, obviously, our staff. Um, because one of the extraordinary things was, was that the, the government's plan, as I understood it, uh, was that we would let go the vast majority of our staff um, and obviously they would subcontract, um, you know, a very small number of people to, to look after the, the people that we, they would be placing in this, in this hotel. Were you tempted at all? Because the government was offering you a considerable sum of money. Uh, we know how expensive things are at the moment, how expensive fuel is, etc., etc. Were you tempted to, to go off on holiday for a year and, and, and just cash in and let them get on with it? Well, I think, you know, for a, for a fleeting moment, the thought crosses one's mind. But uh, certainly I, I wasn't tempted because philosophically I'm completely opposed to the consequences that this policy is having on local communities. Um, the word, you know, cultural destruction is, is banded about. But the truth of the matter is this is uh, the destruction of, of local communities. And... I don't think that whoever has come up with this plan has really thought through the consequences. I can see how people and how hoteliers would be tempted because the amount of money that was offered to us, I mean, it was full occupancy for a year at a very, very generous rate. And um, I, I can understand going into a recession with energy costs. If you're a hotelier and you're at the make break point, I can understand that. Um, but uh, the destruction that this causes is, is, is just horrible in the local community. Well, John, you've said no to the government. Uh, the community here is very relieved that you've sent, said no. Your staff is very relieved you've said no. Um, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us, and thank you for having me here at this beautiful hotel. I'm going to hit the bar now.
Very good. <laughs> well, Jeff, Jeff, thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd love to join you in the bar there. And I have to say, well done, John Mappin. I mean, you could have taken a lot of money, and he said no to it, and the people at Tintagel would be very grateful. I can assure you, from other parts of the country where this has happened, I get emails, phone calls, texts every day from people who are outraged at what is happening. When is enough enough? When are the government actually going to do something that works? Well, joining me is border force and security expert Henry Bolton. Henry